Atma, namaste. We're so, so lucky to have with us today one of the senior most disciples of Grandmaster Chokok Sui. With us, Acharya Dani, who is a world-renowned instructor, Acharya, and has been traveling all over the world. And we managed to get his time today to answer a few questions for us. Thank you for joining us, Acharya Dani. Thank you for having me here. So I know that uh, we've been talking about a couple of topics of interest and um, I won't waste any time, but I will go right into it. Everyone's been talking about meditation and why it's important to meditate. You know, it's a big buzzword right now. Now, how, how would you explain what meditation is and why do we need to meditate? Uh, okay. Uh, Atma Namaste to everybody. <clears throat> now, um, for for beginners, or for those who are just trying out meditation for the first time, uh, it's it's extremely helpful to do some research before you get get into this. And most of the information you'll find on the internet will be uh, very very helpful. At least it gives you some kind of a, a, a picture of what you're getting into. <clears throat> Now, um, so this, this uh, talk is supposed to help give an additional background. Now, the, the practice, the activity of meditation uh, started in the East, in Asia, uh, and is uh, very much associated and connected with the Eastern religions, uh, particularly Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, Taoism, so these, these uh, meditations all had meditation as an integral part of their, of, of their practice, but uh, they did not call it meditation. Of course, in India, it would have been called dhyana or dhyana because uh, they didn't have English then. So the word meditation is a Western term, comes from the West. And the definition, the dictionary definition of me meditation is a Western dictionary definition. So if you look at the Western dictionary definition, meditation means to ponder, to think deeply, to contemplate. Uh, words which sort of give some idea, but don't really, don't really reveal the, the, the breadth and the scope, and the depth of meditation as it was originally practiced. So if you stick with the Western definition, which is, uh, uh, I have to say, still a good place to start. Huh? If you stick to this definition though, then this would mean that everybody is doing it because everyone thinks at one time or another, uh, whether it's a shallow uh, analysis or a deep uh, dive into the intricacies of whatever it is they're thinking about. Everyone ponders, everyone contemplates, even if it's as simple as pondering uh, you know, what dish to order online because you're too lazy to cook. Uh, or, or when you're contemplating uh, the, the state we're in, you know, with the, with the pandemic and the lockdown and everything. So if everyone is thinking deeply, pondering and contemplating, everyone is actually meditating. Uh, so why meditate? Hey, everyone's doing it. So it's like, it's, it's part of our nature to think, to contemplate, and to ponder. Therefore, it's part of our nature to meditate. So the question to be asked is, uh, what's the difference between the meditation that's, that's done or used to be done and is still being done based on the Eastern tradition and the meditation as described by a Western dictionary using Western words? What's the difference between these two? Well, uh, to have a, a superficial or, or, or quick definition, it would be like this. The meditation as defined in the Western tradition is something that everyone does, but it is casual, it is accidental. I mean, it's something that, that may come and go. Uh, it's, uh, it's not often intentionally done. Whereas in the Eastern tradition, a meditation is consciously performed. It is consciously done. A, a, a person who's meditating has to do certain things and it's like a formal proper procedure that's followed. So it's not accidental, it's not 
It's not something that just happens. So this is the, the, the difference. Uh, one of the differences, there are of course uh, uh, a, a, lo a lot. Now, uh, the most common image of a person meditating would be someone who is in uh, uh, Lotus, uh, Padmasana. Yes. Uh, with in their Lotus. eyes closed. <laughs> someone sitting yeah. with their eyes closed and it's in a quiet place. And there's a certain period of time, like several minutes uh, that goes on. And that is like a common image of a person meditating. But there are many, many ways of, of many other poses or positions in which a person can meditate. You have uh, what they call the savasana, the dead man's pose in, in yoga, in and, yoga, which is where <laughs> you're lying down. Yeah. And, and what, what do they call it in English? The, the corpse pose. You're lying down like a bare corpse. And though you're not sitting, you could still be meditating in that position. You can do it the, the way the Chinese Qigong uh, practitioners do it. They're standing, standing still. And they're actually doing meditation. You can have the moving meditation where uh, like Tai Chi, uh, where a person, uh, again, this is in the uh, Chinese tradition, a person can be standing and moving their body. And that is also considered a meditation. And while a person is doing these things, uh, whether in, in Lotus or in uh, Sabasana or, or, or Qigong, while a person is doing this, the mind is not necessarily wondering or contemplating or thinking. It might be doing other things. So in the Eastern tradition, meditation is a, is a, has a broader scope and a little bit more difficult to pin down, a little bit, a little bit more difficult to, to explain in words. And that too, because each tradition, each religion will have different ways of doing meditation. Now, uh, originally, <clears throat> meditation uh, was part of religious practice, part of spiritual practice. So it's, it's as old as civilization. The oldest known religion, Hinduism, uh, which they say is some 10,000 years old or more, uh, has meditation as one of its practices. So the word, the, the, the practice of meditation is mentioned in the, in the Vedas, in the Upanishads, in the uh, Bhagavad Gita, in, in Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. So you have all these texts uh, written since ancient times mentioning meditation and the way they describe uh, and define meditation is so much different from the dictionary meaning of the West, which is to think deeply, to ponder and, and to contemplate. So uh, what is meditation? I would prefer to go to, uh, to refer back to its original meaning, which is uh, that it is part of the religious and spiritual practice. In fact, in, in many religious and spiritual organizations, uh, meditation along with prayer are considered part of the part of the repertoire, part part of the techniques that every practitioner must do. Now, prayer, uh, because some people might ask, what's the difference uh, between, between prayer. prayer and meditation? So I heard this from from a, a Christian priest. Uh, he said. Prayer is when you talk to God, while meditation is when God talks to, talks you. to you. So you need both because uh, communication has to be two-way. And obviously, when you're meditating and you're listening to God, you have to be in that receptive, contemplative state in order to, to hear uh, whatever God is whispering, or whatever God is saying. So. There has to be some internal peace or internal quiet, uh, a, a state of calmness within, in order to enable the person to hear uh, God. So this is uh, another feature that's associated with meditation. It is an internal activity, and it is 
uh, solo. It, it, it is, I, I don't like, like to use the word uh, selfish. No? It's solo, meaning a person is doing it uh, by himself. Now, even if you have a group meditation where a group of people are doing the exact same meditation, listening to the same uh, guided meditation uh, on audio, uh, even if it's the exact same meditation, each person is unique. And therefore, because each person is unique and different, each person is actually doing the meditation in their particular unique way. Because internally, the environment uh, within every person is different from, from each other. The, the thoughts and emotions, the memories, the worries and anxieties of every person is, makes up the unique environment that surrounds him or her when they meditate. So it is an internal activity and it is solo. There's no one else there with you when you meditate. And uh, the important thing that's sought to be achieved while meditating is to be in that contemplative state. So we borrow from the Western tradition in order to hear the voice of God. So originally it was part of the religious and spiritual tradition and for thousands of years, it was always like this. But of course, uh, civilization grows and evolves. And so eventually, after thousands of years, hundreds of years have passed, eventually, the practice of meditation found its way into the West. Uh, and some of the books, they mentioned that it started around the 19th century and became increasingly more popular up to the 20th century. Uh, where meditation has now entered into the, the, the realm of the Western mind. They acknowledge that, yes, there must be something to this particular activity. And there, <clears throat> meditation has uh, gone beyond its, its former original uh, use, which is as part of a religious and spiritual tradition. In the West, meditation has, uh, been, has found application in, in, in non-spiritual, non-religious activities. Like for example, they found that meditation is helpful in health. They found that meditation is helpful in business and, and exclusively uh, just this, this field, like the field of health, the field of, of business, no religion, no spiritual uh, color uh, associated with it at all. So now meditation in modern day times is still probably a combination of both. Uh, it's part of a religious practice, it's part of a spiritual practice, during which a person is thinking deeply or pondering or contemplating things. So that would be probably a, a good way of looking at meditation. So you have a mix of how it was practiced in the East and how it was practiced and defined in the West. So that is uh, what, uh, um, what I, 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 an attempt on my part to define <laughs> something which is a little bit difficult to to describe. No? You know, it's it's like what you said. It's it's difficult to exper to express the experience. But what you said, it's a process. And I guess more and more everyone is getting into the process of meditating, which brings me to the next question. Um, there have been a lot of meditation apps which have which is good because everybody is, is thinking uh, beyond just you know eating or drinking, but there has been uh, an emphasis on you know, wellness and mental health. And there have been a lot of apps which have come up uh, recently. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, what is the difference about, between doing the meditation on an app and having a spiritual teacher guide you through the meditations? Because you know, on the whole, it's all really good because everyone's trying to get better. But I'm sure there's a difference between uh, doing it off an app and having someone read to you or whatever versus having an, uh, a special teacher guide you. So if you could just expound on that. Okay, now uh, to answer this question, um, it is good to first look at, at the reasons why a person would meditate. Why would you meditate? Because uh, from, these, uh, from these reasons, more or less, uh, it helps a person then decide whether uh, using these meditations that are on apps would be sufficient for them or not. So uh, there are uh, 
probably a thousand, a million reasons why a person would meditate. But uh, um, in my honest opinion, I think in general, you would probably have just three major reasons why you should meditate. So first, the first reason why it's a good thing, why it's highly recommended that, that we meditate is because it helps uh, bring out the creativity, the creative nature within every one of us. Creativity is the one, one main reason, one of the three, which uh, makes meditation for me an important activity. It's a highly recommended activity. Now, uh, when is a person creative? You, you see some people, uh, every person is different. Some people can be creative, you know, at the snap of a finger, at the drop of a hat, they can shift their mental attitude and immediately come up with so many, many ideas. These are rare. The average uh, people like us, uh, for example, uh, I'd say we need to be in the mood. Not you. <laughs> no, no, no. For example, to be creative, you need to be in the mood. You have to have, you know, your AC or your electric fan on. You have to be a little bit comfortable. You're not sweating. You're not dirty. You're not, you know. Uh, we all have this this uh, personal preferences. Now, uh, but in scientific terms, they've actually identified when it is what state. Uh, we are in where, when we are creative or we are creative when we are in that state. And in Scientific American, they, they, they have lots of these articles which discuss the four categories of brain waves. If you're familiar, I'm sure everyone will be familiar with these four categories of brain waves. Beta brain waves is when you're active, your mind is active, you're engaged in doing things. Like right now, if I'm talking, uh, if you're actively listening and trying it in your mind to question or to analyze, your mind is actively engaged. You are in beta. Now, the moment you stop, the moment you stop, the moment you, uh, for example, using this evening as an example, if I stop talking, there's a pause, there's a rest, automatically the brain goes into alpha. Alpha is restful state, okay? Beta is active, uh, alpha is rest. So when you exercise, and you're conscious about doing your exercise, you're moving, you're moving, you're moving. The, uh, your mind is analyzing what the next physical movement is that's supposed to be done, you're in beta. But the moment you stop exercising and you try to catch your breath, you're in alpha. Okay. Okay. Now, the third state is theta, which is what you want to reach when you're in meditation. Now, people don't normally meditate. So when do you reach theta? This is achieve or your brain waves go into theta just before you fall asleep and just before you wake up. So you hear stories in history of poets being able to write a complete poem upon waking up because it's still there in the fringes at the edges of their mind. So it was created during their theta state. So theta state is when you are extremely creative. There are many examples given in, uh, in many scientific studies about this. For example, a person is on a treadmill exercising and because they're doing routinary work, suddenly their mind shifts into, though it's supposed to be beta, but they're not conscious anymore of what they're doing. The mind shifts into theta state and they start thinking of their problems and they start coming up with solutions. Or let's say a person is driving and many people have experienced this. I have experienced it myself. You're driving and because it's like you're on autopilot, you know your way home, and while you're driving home, suddenly your mind is working on your problems, thinking of, there's a lot of ideas that come up, you're so creative, and suddenly you find yourself somewhere and you say, how did I get here? You know, it means that you, for a certain period of time, your mind was not aware of where you were really going because it was in theta state. So in meditation, you reach theta state, maybe not immediately, but through regular practice, you train your brain waves to go into theta state. And within, when, when you are within that theta state, which may last a few seconds or a few minutes, you are extremely creative. There's a surge of ideas. There's a flow. Uh, it just comes. And sometimes you wonder, where did this come from? But it's there. It's there. It's just there. When a person meditates, they unlock whatever 
gates or doors that are there within them. And these ideas come out. The important thing is to be in Teta. But the problem is, it's difficult to get there. There are many people who start meditating. They start sitting and going into Padmasana with their hands and fingers in the mudra. And I have some friends who have been doing Zen, for example. Years and years and years, nothing's happening. So I asked them, what do you think that we did? He said, um, all my friends are there and they're all rich and we have connections <laughs> and we do business on the side. I said, oh, that's, that's, that's the reason now it's no longer to meditate, but to enrich one's business connection. But it's difficult to get from beta to alpha, rest will say, then to theta. But through practice, you are able to do this. Now, in ancient times, they had secret techniques that help accelerate the process of bringing a person into theta. For example, they take a bath, a full bath, and when they come out of the water, to some extent, they are in alpha. And or they add physical exercises before the meditation. So the moment they stop the physical exercise, they are in alpha. So they're much nearer now to theta. When they sit and close their eyes and meditate, they, the gap they're trying to bridge to get into theta is much smaller, much narrower, and it's easier for them to get in. And there's even additional secret techniques, which are basically um, breathing exercises. And if you do them in a particular sequence, it puts you into almost theta state. So that when you do the meditation, you're already there. And, and you spend a lot more time in theta state and therefore you have a lot more creative ideas that come in. Now, any meditation, even the meditations on apps can put you in theta state. As long as you practice regularly, you're able to get there. Okay, so all meditation should be able to do this. Now, if the meditation does not put you in theta, uh, something's wrong either with you or with the meditation. Or with, <laughs> with you or with the meditation, okay. But in general, in general, most things on the market would probably help get you to that theta state. The objective is to practice the meditation sufficient number of times frequently so that you train your brain to go into theta so that in the future you can demand it like at will for example on a business meeting there's a problem so you say okay let me think about it your your brain will shift to theta and you have creative ideas come in and then you come up with the solution so that's the objective that we all uh, want to get it's a skill and it can be uh, developed it can be we can train ourselves to develop the skill of getting to theta state Oh, by the way, the fourth uh, brainwave is delta, which is dreamless sleep, dreamless sleep. So if you go, if you ever go to bed, you fall asleep and then you wake up in the morning and say, oh, I didn't have a dream. Don't worry. That's okay. You were in delta. That is dreamless sleep. Now, but remember when you're asleep, when you're in delta, the moment you wake up, you have to go past theta before you go to alpha, before you go to uh, beta. So whenever you pass from delta to theta, that's when you start dreaming. So that's when you have the rapid eye movements. Anyway, so that's why they say most of the dreams or happy dreams or whatever, most of the dreams people have are experienced early morning just before they wake up. So if you, if you check how many dreams you've had or, or when you usually have them, the nice pleasant experiences, at least based on what I've learned, not just myself, but with some of the people around me, it's just before waking up. And just before waking up is because you just move from delta to theta. And that's when you start having these dreams. So the first important reason why we should meditate is in order to develop, to unlock the creativity within us. And to unlock the creativity within us, we should be able to train ourselves, train our brain waves to go into theta state because in that level, at that level, you have these ideas, you have this uh, fount of creativity that just comes up, that, that you can access. And it's going to be helpful everywhere. It helps you more, become more successful, help you solve your problems. It helps with everything. Now, the second reason why you should meditate is for health. Health. It is healthy to meditate. And all apps, all meditations also help you become healthier. How? 
Because when you are put into that theta state, your mind is no longer thinking of problems, is no longer worrying, is no longer anxious. The fears and anxieties are less, the worries and regrets are less. So when your mind is shifted or directed away from what it's what it used to be doing, the body has a chance to heal itself because the body is no longer bothered or interrupted by the negative thoughts and emotions. So it's like diverting the attention of the mind away from criticism because sometimes when the mind criticizes too much, the act of criticism actually uh, disrupts or interrupts the body's attempt to heal itself. So if you meditate regularly, you get good night's sleep. Both activities heal the body because the mind is elsewhere, allowing the body to, to recover uh, naturally. So when the mind is in theta, the body is able to normalize its functions, hormonal imbalances get balanced, digestion improves, the immune system is strengthened, you know, things start to normalize, things start to uh, come back to normal. Of course, if a person is sick, it will take a lot longer to normalize the body. And that's where you would probably need uh, external uh, intervention in the form of uh, phrenic healing uh, and or, uh, or both uh, uh, medical uh, treatment no? in the form of uh, whatever medicines the, the doctor can provide. So health is a second most important reason why you should meditate. The act of meditating uh, is healthy. It is healthy for the body. And if the body is healthy, the mind will be healthy. You know, the Latin saying, no? Healthy body in, uh, uh, and a healthy mind. So uh, that's the second important reason. And these two reasons, any meditation, uh, I'm not familiar with all meditations that are on the market, but I would assume uh, the people who come up with these meditations are uh, have, have good intentions. And, and I would assume that these meditations done correctly, done properly, will put you in that theta state, which will unlock your creativity and will do wonders for your physical body. It will heal. It will bring health. Now, third reason, uh, and this is not something that is available in all meditations. The third reason why we should meditate is for the energy. Now, this requires a little bit of explanation. It's not just energy, but it's what the energy does. So energy here uh, refers to prana or subtle energy. This is more than chemical energy or atomic energy or electrical energy. This is, this is prana, subtle energy. Now, the purpose of subtle energy is to help us advance, to help us develop, to help us evolve to help us uh, up, upgrade. You see, evolution evolution happens when an organism is subjected to a lot of stimuli. So when there's a lot of stimuli, the, the organism is forced to change and adapt because of the, the stimuli that it's encountering. So uh, in the movies, it's, uh, 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 how do you say, presented in a more fantasized version, you know, like Spider-Man gets bitten by a radioactive spider <laughs> and ching. We'll come to the in, movie. In, in, a, in, a, <laughs> in a few hours, evolution yeah. happens and you become Spider-Man. Or, or, or Captain America gets injected with a, a super soldier serum. Serum, and, yeah. Yeah, in just a few minutes, uh, evolution happens and, and he has this fantastic body and, and he, he has super speed and super strength. And, and you have the Hulk, uh, Bruce Banner, uh, uh, radiates his body with gamma ray and, and he becomes uh, the incredible hawk. So in the movies, it's a more fantasized version. The, the process of evolution is sort of shortened, obviously, because they have only two hours to present the story. You know? <laughs> but in actual, in real life, evolution happens over lifetimes, over decades, years and years and years of practice, for especially for a human being. Now, what would be the stimuli that would help a human being evolve. In, in, in our case, based on the teaching we received from Grand Master Chokutsu, the ingredient that helps us evolve is prana, subtle energy. Now, there are many types of prana, but let's just use prana as a generic term. So prana, subtle energy, when you have sufficient quantity and the quantity keeps increasing and increasing and increasing, 
it becomes the stimuli that helps the organism evolve. How will the organism evolve? How will the human being evolve? When this prana is imbibed or absorbed or introduced into the chakras, the chakras evolve, then the aura evolve, the meridians evolve, then the physical body evolves, the blood, the, the, uh, the nervous system, the tendons, the muscles, the organs, the bones. That process is slow. It takes uh, maybe lifetimes, but if you have the right quantity of energy from the right source, the process is much shorter. You can probably accelerate your evolution as a human being within a few decades or a couple of decades. It will take a few decades. It's still, it's still better than lifetimes and lifetimes or generations and generations of hard work. So uh, the third reason why we should meditate is to evolve. And we can evolve only if we have the right kind of prana that is being brought into our aura, into our chakras. So this is where you need a spiritual teacher because a spiritual teacher can give you the right meditation. You see energy, we are able to bring the, the prana, the subtle energy into our aura, into our chakras because of two things. Number one, the technique. If the technique is correct, we're able to bring in the prana properly. The second thing that makes this work would be the blessings of a spiritual teacher. So if the spiritual teacher identifies a certain meditation, programs it so that it will perform a certain function and gives that meditation his blessings, then whenever anyone will do that meditation, they're going to get what the guru has programmed into it, meaning the quantity of energy that they deserve or that they are able to absorb at that particular time. So this is where meditation with the spiritual teacher is slightly different from meditating uh, with non-spiritual teachers because the voice of the person guiding the meditation is extremely important because when, for example, if I'm the one meditating, my eyes are closed, I hear the voice, I have no defense against the voice. The sound waves go in, go into the brain and will affect my theta uh, brain waves. Okay. So if the voice of the person guiding the meditation is not compatible with your system, for example, uh, you just picked up a, a meditation off the shelf and you don't know who the person is. They sound nice. They, they speak uh, really well and they have this mellow bass, which you really like. The background music is fantastic, but you don't know, number one, if that person is vegetarian or non-vegetarian. You don't know if that person smokes or doesn't smoke uh, tobacco. No? You don't know if that person drinks alcohol or, or uh, drinks something else. No? You don't know how clean is the diet of that person. You don't know how clean is the lifestyle of that person. So. If, let's assume the worst, that the person, although of course I doubt you'll find any, anybody uh, who's doing the worst and is guiding a meditation, but let's assume just for the sake of argument, you're a person who's non veg who's a smoker, who's an alcoholic, and is guiding a meditation, then that person's voice would carry the energy that, is, that might not be compatible with you if you don't drink, you don't smoke, and you're a vegetarian. So you have to be extremely selective when it comes to uh, choosing the voice that's going to guide your meditation because the energy of that person is going to go in and it can affect you for good, it can affect you adversely. So you have to be extremely selective. Now, <clears throat> the best is to get a spiritual teacher whose, uh, whose energy would be compatible with all. For example, a vegetarian person's energy would be compatible with both veg and non-veg people. A person who doesn't smoke, their energy will be compatible for those who don't smoke as well as for those who smoke, meaning it's, it's a minimum requirement, the, a common denominator that can be applicable for all. So in the case of uh, 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 spiritual teachers, most of them, if, if not all, it's rare you know, that you have a spiritual teacher who drinks and smokes. Most of them are vegetarian, they don't drink, they don't smoke, and they have a healthy, clean lifestyle. And most of all, they practice... Uh, purity in their thoughts and emotions, in their words and in their actions. They, they, they practice the virtues. So the quality of the energy that a person is going to get 
listening to this spiritual teacher, the quality of energy is going to be amazing. It's going to be much better than uh, someone else whom, uh, who is not a spiritual teacher. So it's good to be selective. Now, of course, you have to do your research. You just can't rely on, on what people say. You have to actually find out uh, the voice band is there, who is this person. You know? So go for the quality of the energy. Uh, I mean, they might not be uh, eloquent speakers. Their, their accent might be a little off for you. But if the energy is good, uh, I would say go with it. Go with that particular person. So that third reason was difficult to explain in ancient times. I mean, because it's difficult to explain evolution. Like, oh, you do this, you grow a set of wings. You do this, your chakras will become bigger. It was a little difficult to explain. Probably it was not the right time. But of course, now, now when, when most people are so highly educated and are able to understand abstract concepts uh, like evolution, and the word evolution has also come up, now, it, now it's a little bit easier to present. Now, look at it this way. Uh, for example, my, my kids, they, they tell me about the MMORPG games. These are, uh, they, had to, <laughs> they had to coach me a bit what this means. MMO means uh, massive multiple player online. Uh, okay. And then RPG is role playing games. So it's like you adapt a character and then with your friends and then you play and then uh, as you play, you overcome obstacles. And then you upgrade, and then you carry this upgrading to the next level, and so on and so on. So there are many games like this online, uh, and the objective is to upgrade yourself, to improve your weapons, to improve your armor, to improve your capabilities, to have secret weapons, you know, uh, surprise attack, etc., whatever. Uh, for example, in PUBG, I think, which is not an RPG game, but but uh, has the same principles. You sort of upgrade your your weaponry or the number of bullets you have, or you, you know, all these things happen. Now, in, in, in these games, it sort of gives you an idea of what you could do in real life, except the time frame is going to be slightly different. In a game, you get to upgrade yourself, you get to level up uh, fast, like in one day, you can probably do one or two levels depending on the, on the difficulty of the game. But in real life, you cannot upgrade yourself in just one or two days. It takes a longer time, why? It takes a longer time for the energies that come in the meditation to work its magic on your system. And you cannot be meditating the whole day. You can do one meditation a day or one meditation, uh, uh, you can do three times a week. And the process of uh, evolving your system will be that much slower. But at the same time, you cannot also do it every day because it gets boring. And then if it gets boring, you drop it and find something else. So it shouldn't get boring so that you're able to continue evolving. So these are the three reasons why you should meditate. And it helps answer why you should be selective about which meditation to follow. So my recommendation would be to, you have to be extremely selective about the voice that you hear in the meditation. And you have as much as possible, you have to choose, it would be good to choose the voice of a spiritual teacher. You can't go wrong with Grandmaster Chowbuzu's voice. True. I'm speaking from experience. I've been doing his meditations for what, uh, 30, 40 years? 30 years, sorry, not that long. <laughs> you look sweet 16, so that's all right. It's like saying the guru's voice is the super serum, which gives you superpowers, basically. Yes, yes, that is a good way to, that is an uh, excellent way to put it. The meditation on Twin Hearts, um, I think it's a lot of people's personal favorite, um, just for the fact that you become a blessing, you become a part of uh, the divine plan. And for all of this knowledge, for all the understanding that you've given us right now, um, I don't know if we can repay it, but one thing I know that all of us can do is actually meditate every day. And you have really, really inspired us to do so. So a big thank you from all of us because uh, it is always a pleasure to sit with you and to learn from you. And I think I, I talk on behalf of the entire team. We're so grateful and so happy that you spent time with us today to, you know, to explain things. And um, of course, uh, you know, we will come back for some more teachings <laughs> if you would let us and hopefully you are yes. trying to get rid of us. <laughs> but we just would like to thank you from everyone who is watching uh, from the bottom of our hearts. Thank you so much.
Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, thank you for your patience also. If you're feeling inspired by what you heard right now, please make sure you go to www.worldpranichealing.com where the schedules for the Twin Hearts meditations are available. These meditations are online in different languages, so it's just a click away and you can meditate in the comfort of your home. Stay tuned for further talks from World Pranic Healing. Bye-bye for now.